Yeah, just a brief introduction. Um, Vlad is an assistant professor in the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies at, here at UT Austin, where he's taught since, I believe, 2016. Is that correct, Vlad? Correct, yes. Okay. Um, Vlad grew up in Bosnia and Croatia before immigrating to the U.S. in 1997. He holds a Ph.D. in Slavic languages and literatures at the University of Michigan, and he has a wide range of publications, including um, a volume that he was co-editor on called Post-Yugoslav Constellations, Archive, Memory, and Trauma in Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian Literature and Culture. He also has a range of articles, book reviews, translations, but also I noticed you have some fiction and even a, a comic book, is that correct? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm really excited. I want to see that. Um, so um, his current book project is called Archival Fictions, which I really like that title, Cultural Memory, Literary Imagination, and the Yugoslav Wars. And so today, I think his talk is related to this new, to this book project, which he's finalizing at this point, right, Vlad, which is really exciting. Um, so take it away, Vlad. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mary, for that uh, really great introduction. Um, and uh, as you've said, uh, today I will be presenting part of a chapter from my um, book manuscript, Archival Fictions, uh, that focuses on the transnational uh, former Yugoslav author uh, Dubravka Ugrasic, uh, who in many ways has been an inspiration for the whole book project. Uh, she was really the one who got me thinking about archives, uh, alternative archives, or even archives uh, in the state of dispersal, archives in diaspora, or migrant ar archives of sort of the emergent transnational culture after uh, the violent disintegration of Yugoslavia. So um, I encourage you, first of all, to uh, check out Ugrasic's fiction. Um, and hopefully I will sort of walk you through in my presentation uh, through her um, very impressive um, bibliography. Um, and uh, so, if a title or uh, catches your uh, ear, uh, I would really warmly recommend that you, um, that you read her. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I, will, I will just start my presentation and uh, um, also, um, so you don't have to look at my face the whole time. I do have uh, some slides and images uh, that are kind of fun to look at. So hopefully um, that will make it more fun to fun for you as well. Okay, so I will start by sharing my screen and uh, we can we can start. Um, Please do so. Okay. Okay. So, um, the presentation is titled uh, Fragments of Utopia, Imaginary Archives in Dubravka Ugrasic's Fiction. And I will begin. Okay. While reading the works of the transnational writer Dubravka Ugrasic, I'm constantly reminded of a wonderful passage from Walter Benjamin's One Way Street titled The Construction Site. Here is Benjamin in a characteristically condensed fragment. For children are particularly fond of haunting any site where things are visibly being worked on. They are irresistibly drawn by the detritus generated by building, gardening, housework, tailoring, and carpentry. In waste products, they recognize the face that the world of things turns directly and solely to them. And using these things, they do not so much imitate the works of adults as bring together uh, in the artifact produced in play, materials of widely different kinds in a new intuitive relationship. Children thus produce their own world of things within a greater one. In this passage, uh, Benjamin uses a rather simple found image of children playing at a construction site as a larger commentary on the methods, materials, and political effects of modern art. 
Indeed, the, philosoph the philosopher's evocation of work in progress, as well as the emphasis on experiment play in exposed form, clearly echoes the constructivist, constructivist principles of design, while the choice of materials, detritus generated by building, gardening, housework, tailoring, and carpentry, celebrates Dadaism's subversive appropriation of waste products of mass culture. As Michael Jennings has argued, the passage offers both, quote, a commentary on the constructive principles of the text and a powerful political allegory, end quote, calling for a restructuring of the state and society based on the principles of social and aesthetic experimentation, transparency of form, and inclusion of devalued elements that have previously been rejected and marginalized by the ruling formations. Much like Benjamin Dubravka Ugrasic from the very beginning of her writing career uh, was mining, and here is Benjamin uh, in One Way Street, uh, here uh, in this picture uh, at the uh, archives at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Uh, so much like Benjamin, Dubravka Ugrasic from the very beginning of her writing career was mining the European and Russian avant-garde for the forms and devices with which not only to construct new exper experimental works, but also to lay bare and demystify literature as a social institution. While Benjamin's uh, aims were largely constructive, however, Ugrasic's were deconstructive, reflecting the broader postmodern sensibility of Yugoslav urban culture at the time, not just in literature, but also in popular music, design, and visual arts. In particular, Ugrasic was uh, engaged in undermining those patriarchal forms of cultural and aesthetic authority that, were histor uh, that have historically excluded women and devalued the private sphere of everyday life as trivial. For example, in uh, Steffi Zweck in the Jaws of Life from 1981, Ugrasic uses precisely the trimmings and detritus discarded by the literary canon, advice columns in women's magazines, dime store romances, and other supposedly trivial genres to construct a sophisticated literary game while proudly exposing the stitches in a self-consciously constructivist manner. Here, the central meta uh, textual metaphor of a patchwork novel is not based on architecture as in Benjamin, but on tailoring and fashion, uh, spheres usually associated with femininity although the formalist principles of construction and metatextual doubling of figures remain the same. Uh, Ugrasic repeats a similar procedure in the fording of uh, the stream of consciousness from 1988. In this uh, sophisticated literary parody of the spy novel and the Cold War literary landscape, more broadly, a tightly knit paranoid plot involve, involving an international conspiracy to stamp out artistic originality and replace it with standardized, easily reproducible literary hamburgers is, generally, uh, is gently subverted and ironized by the fragments that frame the novel's major storyline, diary-like entries and observations on the everyday life of a writer, banalities which, which resist any sort of unity, coherence, and overarching meaning expected of a literary classic. Writing in the 1980s, Ugrasic thus developed a complex, playful, and feminist textuality, reinscribing politics at the profane side of the trivial and the everyday. However, rather than uh, merely uh, inverting the hierarchies between high and low culture, between kitsch and modernist art, Ugrasic in these works brings the detritus of mass culture into the literary frame as a material for critical reflection and aesthetic transformation. With the rise of ethnic nationalism, um, oops. Um, second. with the rise of ethnic nationalism in Yugoslav republics and the subsequent collapse of the state just a few years later, Ugrasic's poetics will undergo a profound transformation. The sight of the everyday, which has preoccupied the author throughout her early career, will transform into a site of destruction and become permeated with trauma of war, expulsion, and cultural displacement, a situation that reflects the author's own autobiography after 1992. In her exile novels, The Museum of Unconditional Surrender and The Ministry of Pain, the building blocks of Ugrasic's fiction turn into fragments and ruins of a once shared Yugoslav cultural and political space, recollected and exhibited in the exilic space of Western European cities, Berlin and Amsterdam. 
Indeed, the lapidary form of these novels exquisitely and painfully reflects the circumstances under which they were composed, confronting the destruction wrought by the Yugoslav Wars from a poignant geographical and aesthetic remove. As David Williams has noted, the museum both absorbs and preserves the growing rubble of what was once Yugoslavia by aesthetically transposing it onto the equally scarred cityscape of post-Vende Berlin, the author's temporary exile residence. By foregrounding literary fragments and the gaping spaces between them, Ugra should suggest collective trauma and unspeakable loss as an inheritance of the catastrophic 20th century history structure, um, the nameless narrator's fractured Yugoslav uh, and Eastern European biography, as much as Berlin's spectacular memorial architecture, which the novel in turn textually replicates in fragmentary, contrapuntal, and imagistic writing. Here, Ugrisha chooses to stigmatize and devalue the legacy of socialism, including those forms of everyday life, which she explored in her earlier work, to recuperate radical leftist commitments after communism's unconditional surrender, and stakes out a literary and political space for stateless, diasporic, and immigrant identities, precisely those elements that have been excluded from the neoliberal consensus in Europe after 1989. Interestingly, however, the literary devices of rich, exposed intertextual networks, sophisticated metatextual games, and literary engagement, uh, liter uh, a literary estrangement will remain largely intact. In this sense, Benjamin's image of children playing at the construction site, creating a utopian, highly reflective space of play that both reflects and critically comments on the larger role outside the text, still holds true for Ugrishich's post Yugoslav works as well only now distinctly inflected with melancholy and mournful affect. Frequent despair in the face of widespread historical violence, the failure of utopian and universalist political projects, and the enormous collective labor necessary to repair that which has been shattered. Recent uh, reception of Ugrishich's work has tended to focus precisely on this despair, and Ugrishich herself, especially in her essays, has increasingly has increasingly expressed profound disappointment at the dead end of our current uh, liquid times, ranging from the racialized politics of exclusion in the European Union, the replacement of class-based politics with symbolic fetishization of cultural identity, the loss of feminist object of critique in the post-feminist hypersexualized media space, as well as what she sees as the new shallow and derivative cultural democracy of the internet. Against this prevalence of negative, despairing, and critically oriented affect that undoubtedly runs through Rishich's exilic work, I would like to recuperate or at least take out a space for play, pleasure, and even hope. Um, frequently accompanies and underwrites this uncompromisingly critical mindset. In other words, I would like to explore those aspects of Ugrishich's work that following um, Eve said by Kosowski, I term critical reparation, a concept that acknowledges the pervasive historical and contemporary forms of oppression and violence, but also mobilizes cultural resources, including literature and visual art, to ameliorate uh, uh, this damage and articulate transformative, transformative spaces of identifications and agency, not so much outside uh, powerful ideological structures as alongside them. Uh, Sedwick's investment in the paranoid position against uh, uh, Sedwick's investment in the uh, reparative position against the paranoid one, which he seems uh, uh, in much of contemporary critical theory, represents a larger shift in her own work from exposing those oppressive ideological and social structures in the context of her own field of queer theory to the question of their performative effects as well as the care for queer cultural texts and objects in a mode of constructing alternative archives. If the paranoid position sees the operation of ideology everywhere it turns its critical eye, demands for constant critical diligence, and frequently calls for complete dismantling of existing institutional power structure, st structures, the reparative position is more reformist-minded, shot through with ambivalence, and invested in rescuing those good objects from history 
and using them to undo the damage in the present. The question then is how can histories and memories that are imbued with trauma and marked by stigma, such as the legacy of Yugoslavia, turn into sites of social, political, and aesthetic transformation, pleasure, and critically reflexive identification in the present, even as we acknowledge the li their limited scope and agency. In particular, Ugrišić has used the archive as a governing metaphor for the preservation and loss of cultural memory, especially following the violent disintegration of her native Yugoslavia. Indeed, uh, she explicitly foregrounds the construction of diasporic, migrant, and non-national archives as a dominant function of an emergent transnational culture, as a kind of third space between nationalism and streamlined economic and hegemonic globalization. And I quote, contemporary deterritorialized uh, de or transnational culture is a dynamic and unusually complex process. The key concepts and themes of transnational culture, uh, archiving ethnic, linguistic, and national memory, dislocation and displacement, cultural shifts and translation and transplantation of culture, the narratives of remembrance, bilingualism, mi multilingualism, uh, exile, etc., constantly mutate, change, multiply, and overlay, the, overlay their meanings in an uninterrupted process of interaction." End quote. This reparative archiving mode, I argue, is especially evident in the construction of, construction of fictional and uh, imaginary archives in Urišić's exilic work, which utilize gaps, erasures, and absences in the official archival record, not only to index violence and cultural destruction, but also, but also to make such uh, traumatic losses productive of, productive of a different utopian imagination. Okay, um, recent theoretical articulations of left-wing melancholia, uh, such as Enzo Traverso's, while looking back at the ruins of 20th century Marxism, tend to not only gloss over the historical experience and cultural production of real existing socialism in Eastern Europe, but also ignore the ways in which the remnants and revenants of this past have been transformed into material out of which writers, artists, and intellectuals have, const have constructed uh, what might provisionally be termed postmodern forms of left-wing memory across the former East-West divide. Increasingly since 1989, such highly mediated and material, materialized forms of memory have themselves become scattered, stateless, and without a fixed addressee, such as a national, most commonly monolingual community of readers. The Yugoslav cultural, historical, and political memory in particular has been primarily recollected, rearticulated, or reimagined by self-exiled, internally displaced, or transnational writers who engage multiple overlapping contexts and who have increasingly relied on translation and international publishing networks to disseminate their texts beyond their former and new homelands. Employing Derrida's terminology from the archive fever, we could say that the post-Yugoslav archival fictions interrogate both the miscellation and consignation, uh, two primary functions of the archive, which have been put in the service of, our, of archival collection under the institu institutional framework of the neoliberal uh, nation state. Conversely, the archival fragmentation and dispersion evident in post-Yugoslav fiction makes visible the violence that has been subsequently normalized in the context of contemporary nation-building processes in the Western Balkans, recalling the targeting of cultural memory during the wars of the 1990s, but also the continuous segregation and nationalization of the common cultural heritage. Mirroring this archival dispersion, transnational writers uh, like Ugrešić uh, have been staging their, um, their own histories and memories in other contexts and, uh, and alongside other cultures, thereby rendering the Yugoslav archive into a self-consciously stateless and diasporic site. Uh, reading the destruct uh, destruction of Vjechnica, the National and University Library in Sarajevo by the Bosnian Serb forces on August 25th, 1992, alongside uh, Dubravka Ugrišić's fiction, Maria Cetinj figures this wreckage of formerly Yugoslav archives as partaking in a specific mode of transmission. 
the transmission not of the meaning of the event, not of the symptoms of the event, not of any content at all, but of practice of future mem memory without a subject of transmissibility as such. While the catastrophe has indeed burned the archival system of organization and rendered text barely legible, as in the example of Vyechnitsa, it has also unexpectedly produced unforeseen conjunctions captured in the images of the burning pages of Vyechnitsa's archive, which floating across the city for a brief moment become legible before completely dissolving into ash. For Tsetinich, the archival ruins are figured and reconfigured in post-Yugoslav fiction as a literature of disaster, attuned to the consequences that such modalities of dispersal, destruction, and fragmentation carry, quote, for the book, for the literary, for reading, end quote. Um, similarly, the Berlin-based artist Hito Steiler sees the archival ruins in Bosnia as a scene of critical reading and pedagogical possibility that transcends the specific location of institutional destruction during the Yugoslav Wars and points to the broader global processes of neoliberal transformation in the wake of 1989. As specific examples of relatively recent institutional destruction, Steiler offers the ruins of the Film Museum in Sarajevo and the Memorial Park in the Bosnian time, uh, town of Vraća commemorating the partisan victory over fascist occupiers in World War II. Both of these sites have been targeted for destruction and radically transformed during the ethnic war of the 1990s. Whereas much of the film stock in the museum was either lost or used for heating during the three year long siege of Sarajevo, the Memorial Park was damaged in such a way that the commemorative text on the socialist monuments has been rendered illegible. As Steiler puts it, the partisan mon monument has turned into a quote, a hieroglyph for liberation from fascism, which is no longer intelligible, end quote. For Steiler, both of these sites in their pre-war state epitomize the modernist and universalizing cultural institution connected to the 20th century socialist welfare state, which in recent history has increasingly come under criticism from identitarian and neoliberal currents quote, because it was not adapted to the needs of the market or because it was not local and indigenous enough, end quote. In the case of the war in Bosnia, the progressive weapons of critique aiming at institutional transformation have been replaced by the reactionary critique of weapons, physically exposing the wholesale destruction of modernist institutions with their belief in equal distribution of material resources, general education, and multi-ethnic participation. However, unrealized these aspirations were in practice. The film museum, for example, housed early film footage of veiled Bosnian Muslim women learning how to read as part of a state sponsored literacy initiative after the Second World War. Along with the anti fascist memorial, this footage represents precisely the modernist and universalizing aspirations of the post war socialist welfare state, which has subsequently been destroyed and thus exists only as a memory. Rather than being localized in the so-called Balkan uh, uh, semi-colonial periphery, this destruction has also taken place on a global scale, only in a less visible and shocking form. So this essay was written not so much, uh, 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 so definitely more visible now. Um, in other words, while cultural institutions previously under the auspices of the expanded welfare state, such as archives, museums, and universities, have been seemingly embraced diversity, they have frequently done so by creating commodified spectacle of difference without effectuating much structural change. In this sense, cultural institutions have offered symbolic legitimacy to a neoliberal social order, promoting a dramatically uneven distribution of resources, knowledge, and capital, which has gone hand in hand with the fragmentation of the body politic along seemingly entrenched lines of cultural and ethnic identity. The increasing uh, lack of material representation, in other words, has been supplemented by gestures of purely symbolic representation and inclusion. The shattered, almost illegible letters in the partisan memorial in Vracha, as well as the devastation and ethnic fragmentation during the Yugoslav Civil War, uh, uh, 
uh, signifies total fragmentation of all spheres of life in late capitalism, uh, a fragmentation which is uh, equivalent to destruction, according to Steiler. For Steiler, uh, uh, for Steiler, it therefore becomes imperative that we learn to read and theorize this fragmentation, quote, because there is no way uh, back to original unity, and at the same time, um, uh, this, fragment, uh, 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 this fragmentation has to be opposed since we, since we can only decipher it in a new common language. In other words, the task is, the task is to imaginally, imaginatively return to the scene of that post-war literacy class recorded on the destroyed film stock to re reiterate the past with a difference, quote, learn to read those shattered letters, not only restoring their original meaning, but inventing a new one, and with it, uh, a new language of emancipation. So for Steiler, a damaged historical document as a scene of collective confabulation and fictionalization in this way becomes a place to reimagine the commons for the 21st century. So such a project would restage the past in a less naive and more ambivalent register, that is to say, without repeating the violence that has kept certain racialized, gendered, and sexualized hierarchies between the subject and object of modernization in place. Um, so Steiler's call for new forms of reading that would invest the contemporary remnants of modernist institutions with new meanings and effective potentialities resonates with the concerns of post yugoslav archival fiction uh, and specifically with Dubravka Ugrišić's work. Uh, taking the trauma of Yugoslav, uh, Yugoslavia's dissolution as a scene of writing, archival fictions reread and rearrange the scattered archival fragments of 20th century modernity, remembering uh, within the politicized present moment that which has been dismembered. These archival ruins evoke broader traumatic losses and absences to which the archival fictions give provisionary forms of me and meanings. To read archival fiction then is to attend to these losses to see how they're formally registered given shape and thus rendered visible and thinkable through new and open-ended uh, symbolic forms, uh, especially since they remain largely unacknowledged or are greatly minimized by dominant institutionalized memorial discourses. So now I wanna to turn to a passage from the Ministry of Pain to demonstrate uh, what such a fragmented, deterritorialized uh, and transnational archive might look like. Uh, so uh, I did include this image from Vojn Bakic. Uh, uh, so this is a monument, an anti-fascist monument in Croatia, which was in fact never completed during Yugoslavia. So it uh, exists as this sort of monument in potentiality, uh, as a kind of signifier of this unfinished modernity. Uh, and presently this monument is completely neglected and exists in the state of ruin, right? Uh, precisely signifying this kind of fragmentation uh, of this anti-fascist, modernist uh, welfare state. Uh, Thank you very much, Vlad, for showing us. Would you, would you just tell us which one is the current uh, image? The current, so the current is the, it's the third, uh, the picture on the right. On our right. Um, so it has yeah. progressively, so it progressively it has been stripped. So it's made out of aluminum uh, and so this aluminum has been sort of uh, increasingly and progressively stripped from the monument, which itself indicates uh, the way this region where the monument is located uh, has been also uh, um, stripped of economic resources. So it signifies also this kind of economic precarity uh, of this region that was really the vanguard in the anti-fascist resistance. Um, so, um, <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see. So, um, so now one, uh, so I, I'd like to turn to this reading uh, of the archive of these remnants in Ugrišić's uh, The Ministry of Pain. Um, so early in The Ministry of Pain, um, uh, uh, Tanya Lukic, the narrator and main protagonist, uh, takes on a therapeutic role involving reassembling the pieces of, of the past that have been shattered by violence, 
uh, a task that she performs in a communal setting by stimulating the instincts for play, memory, and imagination in her students. Um, this reparative work also involves a potentially traumatic repetition of the past, but here it is the memory of the uh, lost object that is evoked, a memory that, while producing that object in the very act of remembering, also alters it in significant ways. Turning to Miriam Hansen's analysis of traumatic repetition, I read uh, Tanya, uh, Tanya's uh, play therapy of reassembling the fragments of Yugoslav memory as partaking in the potentially utopian notion uh, of repetition as difference, one that does not privilege traumatic experience as a primary event, but makes it productive of a future. In other words, seeing trauma exclusively as a primal event constitutes and fixes identities would be to uh, reiterate the inevitability of the uh, politics of resentments, politics that cannot see beyond the accrued historical pain and the retribution for this pain in the present. In contrast to this, Hansen argues that repetition in the mode of the yet once again, it might work this time, is linked to the messianic idea of repairing a history gone to pieces. Through the archive of multiple memories of Yugoslavia um, uh, embedded in the novel, Ugrasic explores the potentialities of Yugoslavia nostalgia in which a tra traumatic loss is transformed into a utopian principle. However, a desire for repetition of the past also comes up against its own limits, and in so much as that past, uh, continually restaged in the theater of memory, is revealed as imperfect and therefore a need for a new articulation which will better uh, answer the demands of the present. Repetition then would not entail restoring the past to its original state, a futile and impossible task, but taking uh, the most ideologically uncontaminated pieces of this past as building blocks for an anticipated political construction to be realized in the future. Uh, so the communal archive of Yugoslav memory is composed of short essays written by uh, Tanya's students uh, become precisely such a site of memory and play, repetition and difference. The archive appears in the first part of the Ministry of Pain and is given a distinct graphic layout that distinguishes it from the novel's main narrative. The first entry in the archive in many ways defines the overall project, presenting us with an image of, quote, the plastic bag with red, white and blue stripes in which the communist past and the post-communist present come together in a Benjaminian constellation. This, quote, proletarian swipe at Louis Vuitton, uh, end quote, as Anna, the student who composes the uh, entry humorously remarks, represents the luggage of petty thieves and black marketeers, a weekend wheeler dealers of the flea market and launderette crowd of refugees and the homeless, end quote. The lowly back can therefore be seen as a mark of all those who have been left out of the promise of happiness in the neoliberal economic, uh, economic economies following the collapse of real existing socialism, those wretched cosmopolitans and global nomads that constitute the new proletariat arising on the ruins of the former. Condensed into a poetic image, the plastic bat also dialectically recalls the past in the present moment with its red, white, and blue stripes conjuring a uh, parody of the Yugoslav flag, uh, red, white, and blue, we shall ne'er be true, minus the red star. Here, Ugrish presents the plastic bag uh, as a parody of the original Yugoslav uh, flag, setting up a semantic hierarchy in which the past, evoking the historical existence of a worker state, is privileged over the present moment. This mo memory of a prominent, albeit absent Yugoslav state symbol, can conse uh, consequently be seen as an afterimage, analogous to a photographic flash that remains in the mind after the uh, ocular stimulus has occurred. A past, in other words, that hauntingly lingers in the present awaiting resurrection. While the after image in Baudelaire's poetry, where it first occurs, serves to preserve a fleeting moment for eternity, giving it a distinctly theological grounding in the concept of the Christian afterlife, Conversely, in Ugrasic's formulation, it becomes highly charged with secular and political meanings in which theology gives way to history. This plastic bag, in other words, becomes an identifying mark of the potentially new subject, the nomads, refugees, and homeless, waiting for their moment to appear once again on the world historical stage. Ugrasic acknowledges that no such subject exists as of yet. And even if it does, then it's still deeply fragmented along cultural, ethnic, national, and racial lines. Hence, the red, white, and blue plastic bag, although used by Poles, Czechs, Russians, Serbs, Croats, 
Bosnian is claimed by um, um, is in fact claimed by none. Instead, it is transformed into a prominent symbol of poverty and objection, mirroring the civilizational and ethnic hierarchy of New Europe. Quote, if I had asked the Poles, Anna comments, I'm sure they would have said they got the plastic bag from the Czechs. The Czechs would have said, no, we got it from the Hungarians. No, the Hungarians would have said, we got them from the Romanians. No, they're not ours, the Romanians would have said, they're gypsy made, end quote. In this contemporary uh, version of nestling Orientalism and racialized poverty, the gypsies occupy the lowest rung of the civilization hierarchy of Europe, like the Jews and queers, they um, embody the foundational uh, bearers of negative identification in the constitution of the modern nation state. It is, yet it is precisely through their exclusion from national belonging that, quote, the gypsies are figured here as the vanguard of a new social order, which could potentially succeed the nation state. The entry therefore concludes with Anna's own in initiation into this imaginary post-national collective made up of rem uh, refugees, immigrants, nomads, and the homeless, all of whom symbolically take up the plastic bag as their banner. Quote, I was aware that by purchasing one of these bags, I had, perform I had performed a rite of self-initiation. I had joined the largest clan on earth, a clan for which the plastic bag with red, white, and blue stripes um, was color, seals, and coat of arms all rolled up in one, end quote. Accordingly, the plastic bag also becomes a metonymy for this virtual museum of Yugoslavia, a sort of nomadic archive where other recollections which exceed the national framework of collective memory are stored as well. As I've suggested, here traumatic loss becomes productive of different and therefore more democratic formulation of at least a European polity. So this is not to say that all memories of uh, uh, in the Yugo uh, archive sustain a nostalgic version of the past, even if this nostalgia is not restorative but reflective to use Svetlana Boehm's terminology. Namely, the past in such instances is not merely replicated, but opens up a, multiple, a multitude of potentialities, non-teleological uh, non possibilities of historical development. Indeed, we saw in the previous example how the playful and poetic aspects of memory are also productive of critical thought, serving as a springboard for new political investments by recalling the disruptive history of the class struggle. The archive also contains openly antagonistic memories that directly challenge the Yugo nostalgic production of the past, even in its more critical variants, pointing to the problematic features of the socialist collective as a deeply normative, if not outright repressive community. In a sense, Tanya is aware of the possibility that not all of our students identify with the all too MP evocation of brotherhood and unity, which gathered the motley Yugoslav nationalities into a body politic. And I will uh, conclude uh, briefly now um, uh, with another um, uh, sort of scene from Urusic's fiction. So um, in conclusion, I'd like to return to the Benjaminian image of the children playing at the construction site. Urusic's fiction, I believe, demonstrates the stakes of this play in terms not only um, of caring for the discarded and neglected past, but also opening up alternative possibilities for the future, especially after the unconditional surrender of left-wing political projects following 1989 and their migration into the imaginary realm of representation, play, and archival recollection. At the same time, if the children through their, uh, um, through their aesthetic activity produce their own small world within a greater one, the greater world still impinges on them and indeed they will ultimately have to return to it and act in it. While staking her citizenship in the Republic of Letters as a utopian space of anti-politics, Ugrišić in her fiction and essays nevertheless points to the limits of symbolic change and of literary and artistic imagination more broadly as an effective tool of transformation on their own. Indicative in this respect is Ugrišić's 2013 essay, Nostalgia, in which, he, in which uh, 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 the author takes a walk through the Yugoslav 20th century, but ends up in Zuccotti Park amidst the Occupy Wall Street protests since that awakens in her, quote, old revolutionary fervor that had been hibernating, end quote. 
the enthusiasm of the scene uh, which the author occupies is someone undercut by the anxieties at the edge of the text, uh, edge, edge of this essay. Build a revolution um, which has migrated further west to New York, to New York ultimately fail? Will it be co-opted? Will it be commodified? So um, in the shadow of current protests uh, and rising inequalities, uh, perhaps we too should ask ourselves, um, will these new pro protests be seen merely as children playing at a revolution uh, and hope uh, that indeed these demands will not just produce another archive, uh, just another memory uh, of a failed revolutionary project. So I will end there. Thank you very much, Vlad. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. And you're right on time. So we <laughs> thank you very much for, for keeping the clock. Um,